in vociferous interest group. There's going to be differing opinions over exactly what what the lexicon means. So we'll cover that. Uh, we'll cover how to in the written word, where, where it all comes from. Uh, the rise and fall and rise of cyberpunk in Western media. Or rise and fall and rise and fall and plateau. <laughs> rise and fall. <laughs> um, a cyberpunk in anime and manga. Do boomers dream of electric nana? <laughs> cyberpunk in the real world. The early days of research in the area. Um, specifically cybernetics. Uh, Cyberpunk in the real world current research programs. Uh, there's a lot of stuff going on at the minute which relates directly to aspects that are generally associated with cyberpunk, but well, we'll come back to that. And cyberpunk in the real world is where things are heading in terms of academic research. I can't really talk about where things are heading in terms of private research because anything I know about there I'm unfriendly exactly. Um, philosophy of the man-machine interface. Does can always equal should? Um, that, uh, that is a very important aspect of cybernetics research academically and all research academically. Uh, how many people have done academic research? Brilliant. That means you all know about awkward things like ethics forms. <laughs> um, does can always equal sure it is an important thing, we'll address it. And then the last bit will be questions and floor discussion. Now, guided academic discourse. Questions are a good thing, ask them. Don't wait until the end of the uh, talk. If you have a question, throw your arm up, we'll pause, we'll address it. Um, alternative views are a good thing. Please, express them, debate, discuss. If I say something that you think's utterly wrong, talk about it. I may well be wrong, and because I'm not at a conference, I'm allowed to admit that. <laughs> <laughs> An engaged audience is a good thing. It's far more important than a rigid presentation structure. If you guys want to talk about something that diverges away from the lovely little list I just read out, it doesn't matter. You're here to be entertained. You know, if there's something you want to talk about and the conversation diverts that way, I don't mind. And also, telling the events officer how long your panel's meant to be is a good thing. <laughs> um, really, this is meant to be a half hour talk and a half hour of nattering. Okay? So, and the end nattering is a key part of it. I, I want everybody who's actually paying attention and gives a damn to put forward their opinion. That's why I don't do these things. <laughs> so, what is cyberpunk? What does Google say? <laughs> Um, Vibartim, a genre of science fiction set in a lawless subculture of an oppressive society dominated by computer technology, or a writer of such science fiction. Who thinks that is an utterly bollocks description of science fiction? <laughs> <laughs> there we go, there we go. That is just Google. Exactly. What does the internet say? Well, you said it was Google, does that count? <laughs> <laughs> well, Google's definition. If, if, if we do a bit of searching, we'll find uh, Margaret Bruce made a fantastically uh, interesting description of cyberpunk. Cyberpunk is a sensibility or belief that a few outsiders, armed with their own individuality and technological capability, can fend off the tendencies of traditional institutions to use technology to control society. Yeah. Um, the next one is cyberpunk is a science fiction genre in which the future world is portrayed as one in which society is largely controlled by computers at the expense of daily life and social order from Technopedia. Personally, I feel that one is probably the most reasonable one we've had so far. And then Wikipedia, cyberpunk is a postmodern and science fiction genre noted for its focus on high tech and low life. Citation needed. <laughs> Right, and when I asked a bunch of fans what they said cyberpunk was, they gave me this. <laughs> Which, to be honest, was a list I kind of liked. I mean, I like everything on the list, but that, that's beside the point. Um, one that didn't make it onto the list, which I thought, which uh, someone, someone said it to me, and I thought it was an interesting angle. Um, they said short circuit. Yeah. 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 <laughs> 
And we'll, we'll come back to that. But I, did, I didn't include it on the list because I figured that would be an interesting topic for conversation later on. That will be discussed later on. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. Uh, yes. I'm going to argue with that. Does, does anybody here want to argue the ghost in the shell isn't cyberpunk? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, does anybody have a definition of cyberpunk they want to espouse to us? Yeah, something that hasn't been heard or to make a comment on one of the ones that we have heard about? Nobody? Um, I would say the technically definition is, if, we, if you accept that one on its own, except you know, the definition you provided, it would suggest exactly why the genre has pretty much vanished in this century, because that is the world we live in now, very accurately described. We're coming on to that. <laughs> I know, I know. This is good. No, no, this is good. I just wanted to say the other definitions to me strike me as more um, as, as standing for, as not just the, the genre as we knew it, but as, as the, the outer areas of the genre that now exists now. But the technically one accurate though it is does seem to limit us a little bit because it's generalised to yeah. the degree we now live in that. <laughs> yeah, I, I definitely agree there. I personally think the Margaret Rose one is a little bit rooted in personal socio-political bias. Um, and the Wikipedia one is very brief in the same sense that uh, astrology is very brief. <laughs> <laughs> and you can very easily apply it to anything. Right. Who's read anything on this list? Good. Has anybody read everything on this list? <laughs> Even I haven't managed that. Um, I have read Cyberpunk. Um, Bruce Bethany's website has a uh, copy of the book that you can uh, buy from him. Amusingly, he's never been allowed to publish it because the rights were purchased very early on by a publishing house which refused to eventually release the book. And there was almost a decade of legal wrangling in which Bruce Bethany ultimately lost. He was never allowed to publish online. And it's an interesting book. I won't say it's the, you know, it's, it's definitely not neuromancy, but it's an interesting book. Head Trash is okay. Uh, Gibson, everybody knows, uh, well, if you've been along to the Steampunk panel, he also invented that. <laughs> um, no, uh, William Gibson's stuff is very socially directed, but he did for his, for the time he was writing the original trilogy and the uh, Red and Chrome short stories, which two of them came before. Was it, was it one or was it two? I think it was one, two. Well, one before, well, one at the same time as the third That's right, yeah. One before, one at the same time. Yeah. Uh, he had very good insight <coughs> into where the technology could go and particularly the impact of the uh, information age on human-human interaction as well as human-computer interaction. Which is not to say that we live in the world of neuromancy. It's a shame, but you can't skip a thing. <laughs> 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 That's it, though. I mean, his, his definition of book, because he was, he was even coined cyberspace, the term. Yes. And also, but his description of it is a consensual illusion which you think about the internet, it's like a place that's not really there. Yes. It's, it's not that far from what we have. Yes, agreed, agreed. And I'm, it's a point that I really like to point out to the uh, to undergrads and I'm talking to them about this, in that the internet itself is amorphous and we just accept that it exists. You know, There is no physical internet. 4chan's, uh, 4chan's joke about how many internet something is worth <laughs> uh, is in and of itself post ironic human. Then again, it's sort of everything in 4chan. <laughs> um, <coughs> my personal favourite is probably Mona Lisa Overdrive, that's kind of a fanboy. <laughs> um, Philip K. Dick, uh, the late, great Philip K. Dick. Um, who's read Do Android Dream on the Left Machine? I've read all of them. I've played on that and. Therefore, I read yeah. Android, and then I pretty much watched the movies, and I went, "What are they based on?" And uh, well, I I read Scanner Darkly, and watched the movie because my dad told me to. Do you want to watch the thing? Because <laughs> 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 I think uh, everyone here has seen Blade Runner. 
Shall I do the walk of shame just out? <laughs> I would heartily recommend that if you don't read Grand Jury of the Left, you do watch Blade Runner. For which version? I've only got 40 minutes. <laughs> can you get the non director's edition anymore? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. You yes, can. You can get the Blu ray set of every edition. And the Yeah. Anyone else in that film can just possibly have thought of what's that actually about? <laughs> well, that was the thing, the original edition we all saw back in the 80s, because they had the voice over told us what it was. <laughs> so we didn't really ask the question at all. <laughs> um, funny, funny as it sounds, there was a uh, video game, Blade Runner, a point and click uh, detective. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah I remember uh, that. Dave had it, um, and he played through it four times, and every time he got the runaway with 14 year old Android answer. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and Neil Stevenson, less known, lesser known, um, and probably not uh, not as insightful as uh, Gibson, and not as interesting as Dick, but worth checking out if you're in, a, in an alternative viewpoint. Again, he's more academic, social. Those are the best way to describe it. I mean, it, it, his, his early stuff before he went into proper cyberpunk was uh, all I all. Uh, Self-hating irony about the academic establishment. <laughs> There's a lot of self-hating irony in the academic establishment. <laughs> <laughs> it's a really? Yeah, it's that coming now. I did not know. Yeah. Announced two weeks ago. Uh, okay, the social and cultural backdrop of. Uh, the period when the initial books were being written, things like Neuromancer, which set things up. Um, yeah, the 80s were kind of shit. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I adore the music, I really do. It was the best thing they did. But um, there was a great deal of depression uh, th throughout, th throughout Western society, except in France. France did very well during the 80s. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, uh, you've got to remember that the, 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 the economic backdrop to the 80s is very different to what we've been used to over the past 10, 15 years. It's closer to what we're getting used to now. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but that and... Whether or not people want to admit it, and whether or not people want to debate it, but there was war on. Um, and it's, it's actually not something that I'm really qualified to talk about, because I only remember the very tail end of it. You! <laughs> I remember it's almost all. <laughs> but I'm not talking as well. Really simply put, it, 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 it used to have what we called hot wars, so World War I, World War II, there's a clear violence between nations and actual declared conflict. By 1970s, it was quite standard for other countries that were very, very small wars going on around the world based around more economic interests as opposed to territory. You weren't after owning land. You were after owning the oil or minerals or diamonds or uranium or nuclear. Advanced. And often you didn't fight. You just paid people locally to fight. So you get a situation like, um, you can go even, even as far back as Korea or Vietnam, you get the Russians to get, get, get the Chinese to do something with the Koreans and the Americans getting the Koreans to do something. <coughs> And so that was a, the Cold War was a war that we kind of called the war, and we all lived with the idea of civilians that this stuff could actually spill out because, in, at least in World War and World War Two, it was seen to be armies, even though civilian deaths became a huge part of the, both wars. And by the Cold War, when I said when I was growing up in the seventies and eighties, we all thought, and the schools and universities made it clear to us that these things could spill over into a bigger nuclear war. And so, by the time I went to school in the eighties, I went to school with nuclear bunkers. You know, with shelter bunkers built into buildings, and it was sand, even the block of flats we lived in, because Switzerland took nuclear, you know, nuclear holocaust as a serious issue being a nation that's technically neutral and has its own army. So, um, you know, a lot of part of the social justice backdrop was absolutely this idea that in, in a world where we were getting more things to buy, and the future was happening, and all this other stuff was happening, we could still wake up tomorrow morning and find someone that pressed the button, and we were all going to die in 20 minutes. 
and this was something you lived with. Yeah. And, cool. and there was also um, in the 80s as well, there was the Chernobyl incident, oh, which yes. obviously made the nuclear um, reaction. Yeah, uh, we have to cover that. Uh, my first degree was physics, where I moved into computer science, and we have to cover a chunk of that in the second year. Um, do you know the actual technological reasons for the Chernobyl incident? I don't, I was quite young. Human error. Was Human it error. Unplugging Turning off safety features in the reactor when they ran tests. Yes. Being Soviet and Russian. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, no, you, you, can't, you can't say that, but what you can say is wanting to make sure they weren't doing it the way the West was. Um, Western nuclear reactors are built on a very simple principle. The control rods are dangled above everything by a cable. And if worse comes to worse, you send in one guy, he dies, but in the process, he cuts the cables and the control rods fall in. Chernobyl's control rods were actually low, uh, installed sideways, weren't they, don't they? <laughs> okay. well, so, my speciality so is in nuclear engineering. <laughs> so when the, uh, when the uh, motors broke down, they weren't actually able to insert the control rods. That was one of the reasons they were critical. I believe they were also, they were also uh, aiming to rush the test because of an upcoming national national holiday. Yes. And the controls themselves had a spike in power. Yeah, it became unstable yeah. at low power. So they actually caused fatality as they went down. Yeah. Bad idea. <laughs> Very bad idea, but we've learned from our mistakes. And right, I think you see, you see segues, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know um, the the nuclear engineering industry has learned from a lot of its mistakes, and in many ways it's now you can't, you can't really less radioactive than you can't really say that considering what happened in Japan recently. Um, oh, to oh, oh, well, well, yeah. there's a big difference between a natural disaster and a man made mistake. And not just a natural yeah, disaster. But too. it's a country where you get earthquakes on a regular basis, you would think would take that into consideration. Yeah. They should have built the, the backup generators on the landward side of the yeah. complex, and that would have saved everything. Yeah, I mean, I've actually been past that nuclear power station when I went over there, and I can remember it's actually in a dip, and I can remember thinking, <coughs> if anything happens to this, there's going to be deep shit. Yep, and of course it. Yeah, getting back briefly to the cyberpunk. <laughs> <laughs> no, you see, but this is the point. We have to understand that when the original literature was being penned you had two potential futures. You had this uh, huge corporate-owned dystopia as the multinationals were finally starting to their own, or you had a nuclear wasteland and, uh, oh, what was that, a brother in the land? Oh, God. <laughs> yeah. Um, and this is where I tend to think that uh, Gibson was slightly prescient, because he essentially foresaw what Facebook and Twitter would do to the world. A, a complete change in the way humans interact with each other, and a complete change in the way privacy is uh, considered. Um, was it uh, Zuckerberg who said there's no such thing as privacy now? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Uh, the Lawnmower Man. Um, brilliant. Very, very good film. Um, a lot of people are I amusing. Mean, when I was talking to people uh, in the department, um, I said I was going to give this talk at a convention. They said, you're another. Um, <laughs> but no, uh, they said that a lot of them felt that The Lawnmower Man was more a social commentary than an actual cyberpunk film. But personally, I think that it was a marriage of the two. Well, at the time, the reviews were all based on the green light of civil crimes and stuff. You know, yeah. it wasn't, people at the time didn't receive it in quite a way that I think, it, I think now we, as we've moved into a more modern culture, it has been become recognised as a film that was doing the yes. only what they come. Yeah, I agree. But uh, yeah, I heartily recommend watching any or all of those films. Um, Would you say something like uh, Catherine Bigelow's Strange Days is a good one? Yeah, yeah. Yes. I think it's kind yes. of it's got everything. It's got a kind of nuclear wasteland of what you were saying one side is, and it has yeah. a postmodernism with the whole big corporate conglomerates about it. Agreed, yeah. agreed, definitely. Um, are there any role players? Like, there's a side punk, maybe a side punk, yeah. Like, yeah. Or corporations. Yes. Shadow Run and. Um, and Accidents. Um, where things happened after the heyday in the 80s. Um, now, I include Judge Dredd because a lot of people dislike it. Personally, I think it was a very entertaining yeah. movie. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I enjoyed the cinematography. I <coughs> enjoyed Stallone as Dredd. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, a lot of people consider it uh, at best mediocre, at worst. Raping 2008. <laughs> um, tech war. Yeah. Okay. The shats. Yeah, the shats. <laughs> <Yeah, the shots. laughs> <laughs> Who has actually read any of the books? <laughs> uh, it's all but it's all based around a series of novels that Shatner didn't have ghost written. <laughs> In fairness, there's a couple. There's a couple of them where I actually honestly believe he didn't ghost write them. Because you can see the emphasis in between every third word. Um, VR5. Who remembers VR5? Yeah. Um, that actually, along with Empire Strikes Back and Short Circuit, determined what I was going to do with my career. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> and Robocop the television series, <laughs> which had a brilliant ending theme, and I like the inclusion of the girl's brain as the computer that ran the city, but by and large it's considered to be poor television. At the same time, uh, the 90s was a rough time for television science fiction of any stripe, let alone cyberpunk, when cyberpunk was essentially telling you by that run that in the 1980s, Cyberpunk was telling you what you you know what might be a problem, you know what, what you what you might have to deny yourself in the future to avoid this terrible ideal. Um, but by the time Robocop the television series and Tech War were coming out, it was saying this shit that you think's really cool that's coming out in six months, don't touch it. <laughs> <laughs> it will end the world and society as we know it. So, what would be the matrix? Ah. <laughs> <laughs> There's the fall and then the rise. <laughs> uh, the Matrix. I think it's, uh, it, uh, it's my personal opinion, nor my opinion as a as cyberpunk. Cyberpunk. Um, I think it, a, a cyberpunk. It's essentially a post. I, I consider it a post cyberpunk yeah. story. Yeah. Essentially, it's what happens after cyberpunk. Um, 
I, I think that what Karsi did say it best when he said it's androids versus kung fu. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. actually, it boils down that everything else is just dressing, trappings, and cool shit on top. And, yeah, <laughs> but but people trying to install meaning. Yeah, yeah, precisely, but uh, ultimately... I enjoyed it. I, I, I enjoyed the first one. The third one, I tend to play it with Babylon 5 Season 5. <laughs> season five. What? What season? I'm saying they're the same. I'm just saying. At least we got. Oh the no, 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 no. Again, brief segue. The Mecca in the second, in the second and third uh, Matrix movies. you go. The only way your evil robots can kill your very biological humans is with giant metal claws, right? <laughs> so when you build your giant robots. What you do is you put your very soft, squishy human in scaffolding. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> just say, yeah, just I, I step know, closer. I know, just step closer. Yes. Who here has seen Code Lyoko? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> is it something more for the younger crowd? Yes. Yeah, I've seen it too. It's okay. Um, I enjoy it. Um, I, 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 it's not great television. It's kids' TV. But we're, we're an anime convention. You know, we watch cartoons. <laughs> um, and in many ways, I, 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 it's something that I have on DVD. It's something that in three or four years I'll show to my cousin's son as an introduction to, uh, to, to essentially what was science fiction to our generation. I've, I, I've already shown him Mysterious Cities of Gold. Hey. 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 Um, the remake of Total Recall, which we've already briefly covered, um, people are throwing money at what was considered. A, a, a money sink in the 90s. Uh, we've got the new Neuromancy movie coming out. People are essentially, <coughs> I'm not sure why Hollywood thinks it, but my personal opinion, you know, I, I, my personal opinion is that during the 80s, cyberpunk was what people thought might happen, and now it's relevant. You know, cyberpunk is actually relevant to modern society. Not all of it, you know, we, we still don't have cyberdex. Um, what's your opinion of your existence? It's uh, a very good question. Honestly, that's a very good question. <laughs> Can I just say that on that note, you have to give kind of a props for being ahead of the curve. When you go back to scanners, yes, yeah. The scanners, even though you've got someone brain hacking down a phone wire, that is essentially a yes. visual representation I'll of what you're talking about. Yeah. Um, so I, I, you know, that it has to be said. The guy was ahead of the curve on that. Was yes, was without doubt. Yeah. Um, and in fairness, uh, Verhoeven mm. uh, during the eighties was. Uh, I mean, okay, again, because Blade Runner was trying uh, to run electric sheep, everybody equates quite really Scott with uh, kicking up cyberpunk <coughs> Hollywood in the 80s. But really, the whole thing put the ball in hand with it. But it always takes Europeans to look at America and come up with the idea. It's, it's us looking out. Yes. Because Europe wasn't like that yet. You know, we're looking out at Japan, we're looking out at America. And we, it, 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 so much of what these sorts of movements develop. Gibson's Canadian. You know, a lot of the other sci-fi authors who predated him weren't American. They were British or people who were really sort of moving into those fields. It's almost like we're looking at something and going, oh God, this could be us too. Yeah. That's what in many ways we were. Uh, yes, that's uh, what I was coming on to. Uh, reasons for the uh, resurgence and interest in it. Do so we have anything that want to put it at that point? Early 90s, it's the date, you know, like Cleopatra 25, 25, Bubble Girl, Bubble Girl, 2040, 2032, and now we're still getting, now we're dating, we're getting closer and closer. I want my hoverboard! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we all want our hoverboard. <laughs> <laughs> and Australia has now built hoverboard, unfortunately, you can only fly one, it's still tech. So, <laughs> still got three years, it's fine, we've still got three years. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's just, as we're getting closer and closer, people are literally going, well, this is all the stuff that the 80s and 90s that we're going to have. Physicists are 40 years away from the future. Haven't we turned Japan, actually? Exactly. Yeah, and as soon 
Yeah. 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 Y
Yeah, but they're going back in time because all of us, like, they might have to give up stuff. In fairness, steampunk got big before the recession. Yeah, but, but that's cut. Um, but then now that we're, we're supposed to be coming, well, we were coming out of it, and then maybe people are going to be getting more, it's more extravagant, or extra, I can't say the word, extravagant. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sorry. I would, I would say that probably at steampunk and that cyberpunk that both popularities are probably connected slightly. Like, the steampunk got popular because a lot of people aren't comfortable with how fast technology is going, yeah. mm -hmm. so they're stepping back. But at the same time, cyberpunk is becoming popular because people are seeing how fast technology is going, and they're trying to, and they're looking at how it's actually going to affect us in the future. Because it's something. I mean, yes, in the 80s it was a case of this is this might happen. Now it's a case of, this probably this actually is happen. going to happen now. I think so also because you were saying earlier that it was set in the time of the 80s, it wasn't a good time financially, there was war on the horizon. In fairness, and we're I, going that way again. Yeah, in fairness, I, in fairness I, I meant it was written during the 80s. Yeah. Very, very, very little time was actually set in the 1980s. Yeah, that's, that's what yeah, I mean. Yeah, it's yeah, kind of we're going yeah, back to that sort of time of people thinking, oh, what happens if society does that? Yeah. 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 Yeah, Dollhouse is, is specifically referencing one of the much earlier science fiction pieces as well. I mean, it's one of those things where it's in the air, and it, it, there's a natural progression from people who grew up with it. If you think, you know, Josh Wheatley is not, and he's actually pretty close to my own age, and I'm 41, and there's a whole generation of people my age in the film business, which is where I'm quite lucky ended up, but we all, we are geeks, and we grew up with this stuff. And what, all our dream projects, the ones, the things we want to do, not what we have to do in our day jobs, is to make this stuff happen. You know, this is why we have. This is why we get to meet actual science fiction authors. We don't. We start talking to them about what the hell's next. Because actually, we all say, well, how? We, what is next? And if, if cyberpunk is the thing that is going to be have a lot of money spent on it, because ultimately, whether we like it or not, we've all got the money for creative development. The fact is that there are worse things you can do right now in genre terms. Because I mean, I, and somebody who absolutely adores comics and superheroes. Even I'm getting to the point where I could use just one or two less superheroes for some blockbusters a year. A little bit more. Yes. You know? yeah. and, and I said, I love them. But the last scene that I was last night, I was like, that's it, I'm done. Mm -hmm. Rest of this year, <laughs> I don't need any more Marvel or DC. I just want some sci fi. Um, and if they're going to use this, then why not? Because the, the one thing that early cyberpunk couldn't do, because we, because it was dealing with a different technological era, nobody uses mobile phones. Nobody uses mobile technology in the, other than what you have integrated into. Yes. So now that everyone is used to the idea of actually having technology with you all the time and always being switched on, you can take cultural ideas and now actually hand in the technology in a recognizable fashion and then take that step further into yeah. the filming world. Okay. Um, just briefly before I move on to science and anime, um, one of the guys in the department said that he felt the uh, biggest I've uh, felt in the past decade have been uh, Batman Begins. Huh? Was it, I, I thought it was an interesting statement. Anyway, uh, cyberpunk in anime and manga. When the, um, when the Japanese got a hold of the idea, they really ran with it. They did some great shit. Um, I love Megazone. <laughs> it's a game in 45 months as you put it. It's a game in 45 But the definitive one for me isn't Akira, it's Dragon. <coughs> yeah. Um, in all its stripes, I know 2040 gets a hammering and every loads crash, but really, I can put that in and it's all good. I, I can watch that you know, a day and a half with, with occasional pizza breaks. <laughs> <laughs> I'm fine, I'm fine. No, uh, Bubblegum, I always felt very nicely caught the uh, corporate uh, the, the corporate corruption angle versus new technology, while not falling into the trap of making an overt social commentary. Um, the social commentary is there, but it's never really thrust in your face. In 2040, it's more so. In 2040, the commentary is more obvious. But in the original Bubblegum, you know what? It's Blade Runner with girls who occasionally get naked before they find room for robot suits. I couldn't really complain about that. Um, Alien Police and Parasite Dolls are the same universe. Uh, Akira, yes, it's good. It, I, I know it's fashionable to say Akira's crap now, but I still enjoy it. I can still put it on, and it's two hours I don't feel I've wasted in my life. Um, Paprika, I didn't expect to enjoy that, but really, I thought it was are you the original book? No, I haven't. They, they had translated the English, and they were all in question. They also wrote Go Look Behind. Very much into 
the science fiction we're talking about, I mean, I would easily put the fact that the book in within the block, the, the wider parameters we're talking about. Uh, Dominion. Hey. Now, this is another guilty pleasure. Puma, Puma, Puma. Yes, there is. Yes, there is. The first two are better than the TV series they did. Yeah, uh, yeah, 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 better than the uh, run of the, 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 the later run. But personally, I still think it's all good. I think it was fun at the time. What I find most interesting about it is the comparisons with Ghost in the Shell. Uh, um, well, it in terms of tone, Dominion is your proper cyberpunk. Uh, everything is black, everything is shot faded, everything is horrible dark future, but it's funny as hell. <laughs> you know, it is, a, it is comparatively light-hearted in its approach. And then you get Ghost in the Shell, which takes the idea of dystopia and turns on its head completely and says, actually, you're living, you're living in a te technological utopia, isn't it crap? <laughs> um, that's more obvious in the standalone complex stuff. You know, the, the original movie was all very dark and grim. It lost well, the humor. The, the original the movie yeah. says more about Oshi, yeah, yeah. says about Shirelle. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. I mean, agree. Sh Shirelle wrote um, Dominion yeah. Tank Police first and then went straight on to Ghost in the Shell afterwards. So. It was, uh, as I say, it's. It's just an interesting dichotomy within the anime, but uh, I always find I get, a, I get a much better laugh out of watching Dominion. Find, I, I feel a lot better after I have than sitting down and watching four hours of standalone complex trying to question what I'm doing with my career. Even the talking to Pete Even the talking to Pete Even the talking to Patrick Holmes. You know why? Because down that path, madness lies. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Salty Riot right, included just because I'm self indulgent. Yeah. I was about to say that's so good, No, uh, Salty Riot right, actually I found was nicely light hearted cyberpunk. It was still cyberpunk. It had less corporate involvement, but it was still your uh, it was still your post technology, if you like, and it had character designs by which is something which made me happy. Uh, Metropolis. Who here hasn't seen it? Right. Um, there's an HMV. <laughs> really, you must watch Metropolis. You get the opportunity. It is worth it. Um, I find that the manga, depending on who you ask, it's hollow color. I don't think it's too bad, but uh, I know what you mean. Uh, First Angel. Um, this was really big about three or four years ago. Yeah. Um, I really enjoyed it. It, it is it is definitive cyberpunk, but it's Charlie's Angel cyberpunk. With yes. boobs. <laughs> yes, yes it is. Um, now, the most thought-provoking thing for me on the list is Demo Toil, which doesn't tend to get lumped in with cyberpunk, but really it is. You know, depending on your depending on your point of view, and a great many things depend upon our own point of view. Um, Deno Coil, I think, was one of the more thought-provoking uh, anime of its uh, of its season, and probably of the you know two or three years around it, in terms of what technology meant to the individual. Um, who hasn't heard of or seen Deno Coil? Yeah. Um, the concept of Dead Oak Coil was essentially an uh, augmented reality world running in parallel to the physical world that you saw essentially through glasses that you put on. And the impact that has on uh, social interactions. And I actually went back and rewatched all of Dead Oak Coil. There's never been industry. I went back and rewatched all of Dead Oak Coil after that brilliant article from uh, Google about their glasses. And more recently, now I haven't, I wasn't, I, have to, I, have to, I haven't seen this yet. It was on the video program, but I was busy. Apparently, it is cyberpunk. Though. The book was. That's, we don't get into human augmentation. Uh, Put it this way, well, the, the, there was a kind of, I think the version of Mark Scramble that never happened would appeal to you more than the version that's ended up. So, can I just ask you, 
Yeah. Just one before we move on. Can I throw one over to Sally? Because I think she's going to have a question about Robocop. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think you were saying that the argument for Pat the Ball is slightly fun. Honestly, I tend to do the horribly shallow thing and just writing it off as giant robot police comedy. And I adore it. It's another one similar to Ghost in the Shell where the TV series obviously very different from the movies because yeah. you have, yeah. you the have term. Actually, yes, definitely. We've definitely got Pat Level 3. Definitely we've got Pat Level 3, yes. What about Sealed Experiments May? Ah, yes. 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 Lane? Yes, uh, Lane would have been on the list if I'd been doing three uh, if I've been doing three slides. <laughs> um, I adore it. I really do. Um, I think it's a great commentary. It, uh, its approach to technology is a lot more gritty and realistic. It's a lot more... You know what it is? 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 You Cyberpunk in anime and manga over the course of the last 30 years. Uh, the changing emphasis, uh, the emphasis on economics versus the emphasis on change on culture. In the 80s, emphasis on economics was very prevalent. I mean, even the name bubblegum crisis was referencing uh, bubble economies. Um, and then you've got cultural changes, uh, which is what later material is focused on. Um, that and girls with boobs and things blowing up. But that's sort of been a running thing. And it's not what I'm going to complain about. Um, the uh, is dystopia really this topic? Yeah, that's uh, what I can come back to with Ghost in the Shell. Because looking at the Ghost in the Shell setting, you know, especially in the uh, standalone complex, it is a utopia, virtually. Um, you know, it is uh, pretty, technology is everywhere, but it's effective, it's. But it is far more dystopic in tone than Dominion is. Um, the change of focus over the uh, intervening period, uh, yes, uh, tanks and cat girls, Duncan? <laughs> uh, moving towards the more subtle and gentle material in Denocoil. Um, don't, let, don't, don't let me mislead you by saying subtle and gentle in terms of Denocoil. It's actually very dark in places. But it is very subtle, especially with how it starts out and how it sets things up. Um, and the way in popularity in terms of, if you compare the amount of cyberpunk anime that was released in the uh, late 80s and early 90s, to how many, to what percentage of anime releases are coming out of the cyberpunk uh, nowadays, what was the, uh, uh, Mardock Scramble, apart from that, Hugh, when was the last time you saw a uh, new okay. cyberpunk release uh, uh, going through the US or Europe? Post the closest thing you get will probably be real drive came to see this ghost thing and they've got a license. Ah, yeah, Dot Hack. Now, Dot Hack, yes, Dot Hack is Cyberpunk. Um, there is a bit of a movement, I think, with a lot of sci fi anime that explores things like the internet, which does actually bring in social stuff on the internet. Yes. It's Dot Hack, it's Summer Wars. Yes, Summer Wars, yes, Summer Wars. Um, yeah, I, I should have included that. Yeah, the new one is on Sword Art Online, which is set in the memo. Oh, really? Yeah, um, yes, Dot Hack. I, I should have. To be honest, Dot Hack can only get electoral its own. Yeah. Um, if you include the entire franchise. Yeah. Um, 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 yeah. I mean, I mean, the the series has some fantastic psychopathy, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. But a story was not existing, it was better. Yeah. 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 So we're doing okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's like Aura made the right call after all. She, she, she said that over. Um, yes. 
Uh, cybernetics is a uh, research area that began in the uh, mid 19th century. Probably the early 19th century. The first reference was 1827. Don't call correct me. <laughs> 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 Um, really big ones, uh, James Clark Maxwell's paper on self-regulating devices. Cybernetics, uh, the, the etymology of the word basically comes from a discipline of self-organizing, of the discipline of self-organizing systems. Um, because that's all a robot is, it is a self-managing system. Um, and you've got to remember that from a computing science perspective, there is no difference between uh, a terminator and the uh, vocal log. They are all agents, they are all designed the same way on software level. What changes is your engineering and your robotics. Um, Bell Labs, the Amplifier Control for Negative Feedback paper, that is essentially an inventive control system. <laughs> uh, it's a very interesting paper if you can tolerate the language that scientists used in 1927, which is better than the language scientists used in 1688 than <laughs> translated print it here. Uh, Von Neumann, uh, not very famous for what he did, but the work in cellular automata was essentially proto-bioinformatics. And um, when you're coming down to AI, which is, AI is distinct from cybernetics, but an intrinsic part of it, when you look at the perspective we are, which is artificial agents. Um, the concept of uh, cellular automata essentially led into what we call bioinformatics, which is looking at biological systems and saying, how can we replicate that? The most common example is uh, artificial neural networks. Um, the, where you look at the fact that the human brain is a, uh, is, a, is a partially connected neural network of several billion neurons. Let's try and represent that on a computer. The best we've managed so far is an American supercomputer that managed to replicate a half a mouse brain. It was a particularly Whoa. stupid half a mouse brain. <laughs> <laughs> but they did manage to get some correlation between things that they might expect to happen to a half a mouse brain, if a half a mouse brain could exist without the other half. Was that in real time or was that with a <laughs> <laughs> That wasn't real time. That wasn't real time. But the, the, the uh, results were very interesting. And it sort of made people look again at neural networks in practical sense. Did it, it just say stopped. cheese? Alan Turing, who gave us everything and took away everything as well, um, wrote a fantastic uh, paper that I had to review but, yeah, um, where someone was talking about uh, the fact that 4chan has made it possible to pass a Turing test. Because an expert system to make a believable poster on 4chan is only a 10,000 lines of code. So it's more about 4chan. Yes, quite literally, memes and stock insults. And you, can make a, you can make a person that you can make a poster on 4chan that nobody can tell isn't, isn't a regular poster. <laughs> Start paying attention to robotics again in a non industrial making cars sense. Um, yeah, briefly, uh, Skynet and the concept of the machine that can kill somebody. I bring this up because we're discussing industrial plants and cars. It's very easy to build a robot that kills somebody. It's very hard to program a robot to kill somebody without saying explicitly, you can kill somebody. That's why we like humans driving. You know, it's the, 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 the Skynet system could only have come up with kill Sarah Connor in, in the, uh, as, it, as the solution to its problem. If some wanker who designed its uh, genetic algorithm put in the, uh, the, the elements kill Sarah and Connor <laughs> <laughs> through a few generations until it came up with it. Um, yeah, biological analog, we've already touched on that. Multivalue logic systems, what I do, well, what I did do other things. But uh, my PhD was multivalue logic systems. Who's heard of fuzzy logic? Yes. 
Uh, Zade, God among men, invented fuzzy set theory, and essentially let us create what we call the linguistic variable in computing science, which is where we say, kind of. <laughs> Someone is kind of tall, there's the fuzzy set. There's short, there's tall. Someone kind of tall has a membership of kind of tall that falls in there. The, you know, five foot eight, they're probably 0 0.8 kind of tall. <laughs> um, and elementary robotics, but not in the microelectronic sense that we tend to consider it nowadays. Um, current programs that are ongoing, no reactive prostheses, these have been in development and research for well over a decade now. Um, <laughs> we've yet to get, I've yet, I've yet to read anything which actually says that one has been successfully implemented in the way everybody wishes they would do. Um, but there's a lot of literature out there you can find on Google Scholar, which is great, by the way, for those who have an interest in any topic, use Google Scholar. It's how, it, it's how most real academics pad out their references. <laughs> <laughs> um, no reactive prostheses, you say, the hand, say I have an axe at the door and the hand falls off, um, load, in, load, load in nerve endings around there, we put on no, uh, sensors that can detect them, and we essentially calibrate the system for a robotic hand that moves on the basis of if I mentally try and move the thumb that's no longer there, it takes a record of what the nerve impulses were when I was doing that, do that a few thousand times, and potentially with a system that works. As yet, to my knowledge, we've yet to, it, there's yet to be a one that properly works in the way you want it to. But there have definitely been very positive experiments where um, I think I saw a one where you actually saw the robotic hand doing that, which is a massive step forward in the field. Um, it's making it do that consistently that's the problem. Um, Um, is there going to be a need for that though, with biology progressing as quickly as it is, um, stem cell research and everything else? That's a very good question, and to be honest, we're going to come on to that in a bit, but it is a very good question. There is some things that work kind of the other way around, like uh, cochlear implants and stuff, which it's, rather than trying to get messages out of your body, trying to get send messages, messages in. into your body. Yes. And also quite a few um, sort of brain scanners and things which work directly on the brain. Yes. Um, in fact, um, a bit of military research and development that recently published a paper, so everyone can talk about it, was uh, actual uh, put, uh, sensors on a helmet which, permit, which uh, could fire and track targets um, on the basis of uh, nervous and getting nerve impulse. Um, augmented reality, that's been in the works for ages. You know. I, I despise the term because I don't think it's augmented reality personally. I think it is a parallel, it's essentially a parallel reality. Um, or at least it will be by the time the technology is actually brought in because we're, we're essentially evolving along the track that we would be if the technology was here to the point where by the time the technology is here, we're already bypassed it. Um, but, 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 it but it'll come. Uh, the, the, the Google spectacles, when they come out, will be a massive one. Uh, Sony are already there, to be honest. They've had, uh, they've had production specs for ages. They've never thought of using the technology that way. So they will. Eventually, someone will wake up. Um, and it'll be interesting. I personally don't think it'll be good, but it'll be interesting. <laughs> um, no, no, the, the, the augmented reality stuff is you, you put on your set of glasses, oh, right? right? Yeah. And I look over there, and my <coughs> and the GPS built into the glasses says, I am at this location in this room of this building. So I can now see where all the fire where all the fire roofs are, the instant fire alarms go off, and my thing is updated and say there's a fire in them. It's a very, it's very, it's very clever ideas. Um, I've just had a thought with the whole augmented reality Google glasses. Isn't that just a more thorough, better take on the whole VR system that uh, mid nineties? Yes, giant headset. Like um, yes, Google's essentially, system. it's combining that VR tech from the mid nineties with the uh, with, with, with essentially the digital information age. The fact that your 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 iPhone or your Android phone can tell you anything about anything, from any location that's got three G connect, that's got three G connection. Um, blend the two, and you essentially get an information overlay, um, which, other than Deno Coil, was expanded to include virtual pets and see your little virtual doggies that runs around, and all kind of creepy. 
Sorry. Sorry. combining the idea of augmented reality and demo coil, um, like the internet in general, do you see anything where, say, in the internet you can buy a domain, would you be able to buy your plot of land that your house is on and put augmented reality? Second life. Probably so in America. Yeah. 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 Probably in America. Yeah. Second life is so big in France. The fact that the society is so big. No, no, I, 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 I think they're meaning actually buying, like, buying, buying the representative in the world. Virtual space. Any country that's already got used to the idea of virtual real estate will transfer it quite more, more readily yes. by the public. The idea of saying your actual house. Yeah. It's virtual domain around that. So it's like buying airspace. Yes. The question will be whether or not. Uh, Countries that aren't really used to that concept would consider it invasions yes, of uh, privacy. You know, do you, do you have the option to force deactivate what somebody else has done their house? Should you have the option to force deactivate what somebody's done to their house if you're on the same virtual server, etc., etc.? Um, but yes, I can definitely see that sort of thing coming. Um, probably in a decade or so. Legal thing is very difficult. Does I know that I'm in virtual or that's vintage. A, well, that's that's but um, Berkshire can do actually have a planning portal for, they did have a second life planning portal. And I can imagine them preparing for the reality. Some councils are actually putting these in place. Yeah. But, I, I actually, very forward thinking ones, most likely, that will be very ahead of the game when technology catches up to what people think it should be doing. <coughs> I actually work with a 3D mapping solution, and I mean, it's not like if you buy the 3D plot of land in, uh, for somewhere, you own all the 3D plots of land in every game that could be. So it'll be like you'll own the 3D plot of land in real world of Warcraft or whatever they want to make. Or, or one server, or one game, or one system. So it's not like you can just own your land in your, in your world and all of cyberspace. Yeah, this is, yeah, this is the point. Once you're talking about augmented reality, you're talking about the n-dimensional yeah. yeah. world. Uh, so I realise this, yeah. but like, not the, the internet is basically everybody uses um, like HTTP and all the rest of it um, as the standard. Is it likely that everybody will converge on using one particular yeah. Um, honestly, I doubt it. I think, we, I, I think that if it did come, there'd be severe competition about it. But as I said, we are talking about decades away before it's anything practical. In my mind, in this, at least a decade. You know, I thought it would be decades away from, the, from where we are now, five years ago. So. <laughs> um, things are moving very quickly. But you are going to deal, as Jonathan says, with an n dimensional world, you know, where the. Uh, where, the, where that unfortunate thing about no two objects can op <laughs> occupy the same space at the same time no longer really apply. Yes. <laughs> um, I just don't want more spam. It will be visual graffiti. reality. Would you like to buy a big house? <laughs> when you, you know, somebody pays that uh, when you uh, mention to a friend that you're hungry, your system picks up on that and says, "There's a McDonald's two miles in that direction." Would you like to get the VR goggles free? Someone sues because an augmented reality game that they bought Vision, they got hit by a car. Yes. <laughs> um, well, well, was over their real advert. Uh, oh, now it's going to get interesting. Yeah. The lawyers are going to make out on this one. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, every hand, everywhere. I know, I was going to say, lawyers are always the ones who make out. <laughs> this one I've always found very interesting. Um, it was announced back in 2002. Um, back when the first one <laughs> uh, <laughs> Um, and it was a project, it's essentially a, it's a nationally funded Japanese research project with the goal to create an artificial intelligence with all the emotional capacities and capabilities of a 10 or 12 year old girl by 2032. Now, for those who've seen Double Gun Crisis 2040, we know what caused the earthquake in 2032. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Effective computing is kind of what I do. And MIT and other <laughs> <laughs> things. No, uh, effective computing is essentially the bit about making computers feel, or making computers act as though they're feeling. MIT is really the hope of this. They have a fantastic little robot that's in utter. So <laughs> it's, it's, it's evil. It's nasty. <laughs> but it's believable. 
And that's the point. It is the most emotionally needy piece of crap technology. <laughs> um, it, 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 part of its programming is that it desires attention. <laughs> and the bastard desires attention. Don't teach you cosplay. Right. Professor Hedden Warren. Don't mention him, please. Professor so well. Don't mention him. Right. Um, what would you say to somebody who implanted a microchip in his wife so that the kettle put itself on? <laughs> would, you, would you say he has the sexual politics of a man raised in the 1950s? This <laughs> 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 <been> so polite. <laughs> um, Professor Kevin Warwick is a visionary in his field. It's just personally, it's a field that I think we shouldn't be exploring. Professor Kevin Warwick is essentially the, pi uh, the pioneer in the UK of wetware technology. So, can I, I'm sorry, I really feel that you really need to preface that with the fact that he is his biggest promoter in one end, Sandy yes. and Harry Sneer, all sides do need to themselves as brands. He has developed a cult around himself that frankly it's sells creepy. him in a way, I mean, I've been to panels of things where I've got the folks in him live, and I've seen people who worship and speak to up and do it for him, and I am terrified of the idea that this guy is genuinely ahead of the curve, because he, 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 he can never reproduce. Everything that he goes to the TV with suddenly is not reproducible when he's up in front of you in an actual panel. You know? That's... Yes. Sorry, I just it's, the one I've seen. I probably wouldn't criticise another scientist's findings yeah, versus precisely. their evidence, but... The, uh, his work is very interesting from a certain perspective. It's about uh, essentially, remember I was mentioning the nerves and the detection? It's essentially bypassing the middleman, you just shove all the hardware into the human and see what happens. Which I find, despite the fact that I work in the air, I find that hellish creepy. <laughs> 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 and they look quite their sex human revolution. Shove it in your own <laughs> I've read papers he's published, but I've never queried the uh, results in them because that's a nasty thing to do to anybody. If uh, if if anything did come up saying that he had bilked everybody, um, there would be a human cry that most people here would never hear about. But anybody who writes anybody who writes for either the Lee or Sigraf would, <laughs> basically. Yes, but they would never hear about what happened. Well, that's, uh, well, that's what, I mean, that's the point I was trying to make. I mean, yeah, if, if anybody screwed up in that way, yeah. uh, plenty of scientists get pulled on uh, on fudging their research. It's it, it's a it's an occupational hazard in many ways of reviewing papers. How many times were how many times have you read about it on the news? Yeah. For me, in the past decade, there's only been the climate game. MMR? MMR. MMR. And the clothing, clothing. Yeah. Yep. And that's three out of, <laughs> what, 200,000 academic papers written, written and published every year across all the, across all the disciplines. And, that's, and uh, if, if only three of, uh, you know, Two million papers have been based on uh, there fudgy was resources. Someone, I can't remember his name now, but it was in the astrophysics community um, where he was getting to the stage where he was being considered for a Nobel Prize and yes. someone blew the whistle on him. Yes, and he suddenly realised that everything he'd done from his PhD onwards was crap. It was fudgy, yes. <laughs> and it was, they did it by analyzing the, um, analyzing the statistics. Yeah. But is fudging a real problem? Look at Gregor Mendel, he fudged his results, but now we know what he was doing is actually proven to be true. Uh, I think it's a different situation. When you're talking about fudge numbers, you aren't talking about fudge results of what happens if you put a microchip in somebody's arm. Um, I mean, I actually, uh, Jerry Mendel, who did Hydrogen Plus Logic, I uh, ripped one of his papers apart in my uh, first paper, a paper that he co wrote with my. PhD supervisor. <laughs> um, that, that, that was a fun conference. Uh, it, was, it, it was a simple enough mistake that they made, but you know, we've got a solution to the problem. Anyway, 
what will happen in the near near future? The current projects, will they deliver? Nobody knows. You know, I will definitely be getting augmented reality. That that's a given. Um, we'll definitely, I would say, we'll definitely within the next twenty years get get suitable robotic replacements for limbs. But by then, as the gentleman there pointed out, I suspect the entire topic will come down to uh, individual preference over whether you go for a robotic replacement or a biological one. Um, robotics. Not in the sense the media thinks. We aren't going to get Johnny Five, which is a bitch. <laughs> we are getting a remake of Short Circuit. <laughs> which, we are getting a remake of Short Circuit in which the Johnny Five robot is found by a poor little boy from a broken home who teaches him about love. Oh, no. oh screw that! I want jokes about the Three Stooges. <laughs> it's also being remade. Yes. <laughs> um, robotics. We will get more automation in systems. We might, within 20 years, finally get somebody who's willing to let us test a robotic car on a road for more than 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, but the fact of the matter is that robotics as a uh, field is stymied, by, is stymied by microelectronics. It's no longer stymied by computing, which used to be the problem. Um, but it's now waiting for microelectronics technology to catch up, and materials physics to catch up, the point where things can be made that are really useful. Um, but no, we aren't going to get Androids by 2030. That's no, not going to happen. Probably it won't happen in my lifetime. Um, so, certainly not the way we see Androids in Bubblegum Crisis. <laughs> Which is a bitch. <laughs> yeah, we, we have Asimo. <laughs> <laughs> Which is not a boomer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I don't know. I think it's worth the risk. <laughs> Skynet. You go first. Uh, Skynet, not going to happen. Um, quite aside from the fact that, well, actually, no. Skynet is going to happen. There are currently three military projects that I know of called oh, Skynet. Yeah. <laughs> um, but none of them are a universal, uh, a universal control for the big red button. <laughs> There's also the Japanese company Cyberdyne. Which yeah, I, know. <laughs> I saw that, that was hilarious. You have to put it if they knew or if they just got really drunk and said, yeah, let's just do this. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh! <laughs> yeah. We all, yeah, the, the marketing guy thought it was great until 2.13 Eastern Standard Time. <laughs> <laughs> so, Skynet, not going to happen in the way that uh, everybody thinks with evil mega computers taking over the world. It's outside our ability to program. And we can't yet write programs that can rewrite themselves more complicatedly than we could write them if we took an extra, you know, 20 or 30 or 40 percent of time to do it. I'm just wondering, what about um, that computer in the Eagle Eye movie? The Eagle oh. Eye movie. There's a oh, computer that's oh, yeah. like kind of. Oh God, I, I'm sorry, I don't watch Shia LaBeouf movies after the, you. the first. <laughs> <laughs> It's basically a remake of that kind of that 80s style film done with post trump and the of money in the day. The important thing to remember is that for a computer to do anything, it has to be programmed to do it. You know, Intel inside, idiot outside. <laughs> um, unless someone is dumb enough to actually program a computer to automatically fire all the nukes in the world, <laughs> it's not going to happen. And anybody who tried to put in something like a uh, self-critically self updating uh, genetic algorithm, which is, probably the, which is pretty much the only mainstream way of generating uh, emergent behavior in systems, genetic algorithms through multi-agent systems. Isn't that uh, what Summer Wars is basically about? If, if anybody was dumb enough to plug something like that into a system that could annihilate the world, <laughs> then as a species, we've probably had our run. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, but it, is, it is not going to be the case of one day Skynet woke up and said, ooh, humans. <laughs> um, robotic limbs are feasible. You know, as I say, they are feasible. Whether or not they'll be useful in time to get them is an open question. Um, Cyberdex, who cares? I mean, I thought it was great when I first read it, but realistically, you have a P5 glove with augmented reality glasses, what more do you need? You, you can mimic almost everything that a cyber deck does through that system, just through haptic uh, control devices that we already have. 
you know, you plug in additional VR components into it, and you're there. You don't need to plug jack anything into the base of your spine. Um, true wetware. Oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's where we come onto this. Does uh, can always equal should? <laughs> um, no. Personally, <laughs> I think that it behooves all scientists to consider whether or not their research is worth it. Um, How do you know what's worth it? The time that you could come you down to many judgment. years later. You make your best judgment. How about we do some actually who thinks it's worth it? Who thinks that being able to tell your wife or husband <laughs> that the kettle needs putting on when you're two minutes away from home is worth installing a microchip in them? Isn't that what Siri does? Though? <laughs> <laughs> or how many of you would send a text message? I will send it. Even the little bit It's not wetware. That is taking some. That is taking something out of the human and putting it into a robotic setting. It is essentially, it's essentially a whole body prosthesis. What you're talking about. Wetware is a convenience issue. And to be honest, I still think it would be kind of creepy to put a human brain into a robot. I understand the rationale. I also don't think it would work because I think you'd find the brain that you have. You'd still have brain death before you could feasibly get to proximate. Awesome. <laughs> I, I think you would still. Yeah, but I, I see your point. I just think that, by and large, personally, I think that wetware isn't something that we need. We already demonstrated that so much technology we can essentially miniaturize and carry around with us. There's no need to actually build into our heads. Um, but that's because I'm old. <laughs> you know, I mean, I am very. I, I'm, a, I'm a stick in the mud. I'm like. Duncan, no, <laughs> in the nicest, nicest possible way. But you talk about augmented. Wouldn't it be nice not to wear the glasses for augmented and have it already in your eyes? Well, why would you do that? You have contact lenses. Why not? Because it's already there and it's not interfering with your eyes in any way then. Well, there's oh, not there's not there's 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 You've got to look at girls around you. Look at how many people are still wearing glasses in the near yeah. where contact yeah. lens technology has reached yeah. a point. Uh, a lot of us don't need yeah. it. Yeah. How many of us yeah. are still more comfortable with a device attached to us as opposed mm. to... Which you can take off when, when, yes. when you don't need yeah. it. Like, yeah. If it's implanted, you, can't, you don't have that choice. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Everyone's yeah. aware is you can't remove this. <laughs> Not yeah. easily. You know, it's a surgical process normally to insert wetware. Yeah. That's what uh, Professor Warwick does. Mm. It's a surgical process to install it. It's a surgical process to remove it. Personally, yeah. I'd rather just take off them and yeah. the yeah. if, if, book. Yeah, if your VR glasses get a virus, you take them off. But yes, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> we, if, you were, if you were ready to be hacked, literally and brain yeah, hacked, this is where we go back into shadows. Oh, we'll sit straight into the shadows. How do you turn your eyes on, on and off again? Well, that's the trick. Yeah. 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 Jordan yeah. reports his virus. Yeah. 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 If you install hardware, electronic hardware into your watch. That electronic hardware has better be the single most secure piece of kit you can possibly imagine. Would it have trouble with uh, pacemakers? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Like and that's before you get into... Uh, and then there's uh, a billion cards in the start because we had um, something similar to the Google goggles that were physically attached to replace things and now I'm going to remove them. Yeah. It goes into uh, the tunnels and of course it's taking pictures of everybody yeah. in there. But people that the uh, staff didn't like it, he basically got mugged and kicked out. Yeah. But they, they had pictures of the perpetrators, didn't they? Um, I don't know how relevant it is to wetware, but I do know um, I did that it, for a lot of people. Especially, I'm going to talk about religion here, so don't hurt me. Um, it's probably a sign of the apocalypse if we actually have to start putting our microchips into hands oh, after please. the rapture. Oh. Apparently, when the, if the rapture happens, the sec gets the Antichrist will come, and he's going to get everyone to have the mark of the beast, then, which is apparently going to be a microchip, which is a way of tagging people. And if you have the microchip, it's actually you can't be saved. It's 
from a website called Rapture Ready, which I found through QI, but, so I'm not actually a believer, but it was, yeah. it's really interesting to the, read. The apparently. reason they give is because there's basically the idea of someone having a mark on them that they can't do a, trans a, like a, a money transaction without. Yes. And so y y it could be seen as like if you've got like a physical mark in hand because you've got a microchip in there, then that would be you doing still, transaction. Yeah. You I know it's still silly, it. but... Yeah. You could still carry a wallet. Yeah. I mean, the people, the, the, no offence, but the people who believe that also think the same thing about tats. Who's got tats here? <laughs> there you go. Sorry, guys, you're not going to heaven when it comes. Yeah. End of story. I mean, you know, and how much credibility do we yeah. need to give these stories? I mean, admittedly, yeah. I do know. I mean, it's from a right. website, it's from the Rapture, so these are people who do believe that one day several thousand believe, righteous Christians well, are going to vanish in the blink of an eye. It's supposed to already happen. The fact is, we're all still here, and so are they. So if they believe it, I'm, I'm sorry. If they believe that, they're all stuck here too with us, and it went very badly wrong for them. Look what you've done now. Jesus. Well, <laughs> things to a close, we're almost done. We're almost out of time, actually. Yeah. Yeah, we are almost out of time. Okay. Um, augmentation for augmentation's sake. This is where we come to what the gentleman here was mentioning where once you have the option to replace your uh, arm with an arm that has a laser in it. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you think about how piercings and tattoos and things like that go on, it, is, it could entirely be a fashion statement. And yeah. Yeah. Laser is a fashion statement. <laughs> <laughs> and at that point, you have to ask questions which Git does in a very media-friendly way about about the nature of humanity and how humanity reacts to the idea of other humans who are better than them simply because, literally, they have the money to buy better bodies. Yes, exactly. So Kyber did that as well with the memory system shock. Because you yes. buy better memories so you can buy yes. a new body. The other thing in Kyber was with the whole disparity between the people who could afford to back themselves up. Because yeah. you're backing up their memories and essentially backing yourselves up and people who were completely impoverished and couldn't. And you know, um, you know, an early episode where someone was shot and he just exploded and gone forever. And he was just like, oh, why wouldn't you back yourself up? And it's, you know, it was this kind of the subclass of people who couldn't do that and, and have this very finite existence, whereas anyone who was wealthy could essentially live forever because all you need to do is remove the chip and put it into a new avatar. Yes. Yeah, you could say that about Repo, the genetic opera as well, a yes, little. Yes, exactly. Very well, yes. 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 Y
<laughs> was like running, you didn't have to have a, a bracelet or strap. So what happened to the TSA scanner? Yeah, yeah. Because that's useful. Yeah. 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 This has been absolutely great. We've well, been a great audience. We are going to have to knock it on the head because we really want this room now. So thank you all for coming. You're welcome. <laughs>